welcome to Deep Dish Dialogues. Uh, I am Rebecca Gordon, and I am one of the Anita Stewart Memorial Food Lab Managers and also the Culinary Projects Lead with the Errol Food Institute. I am thrilled to welcome everyone here today. We have pretty much a full house here, and then also online we've got a, a great group of people tuning into this event. We're really excited to be able to welcome Ted and Dean today. It's been about a year that we've been working together, trying to, yeah. to navigate and put this event together. And it's great to see that there's so many people who are interested to learn more. Today's event is really going to be a lot about Indigenous cuisine, also training and education and, and how we can make sure that people are, are being supported and, and provided the skills that they need to be able to work in the hospitality industry. Uh, it is, this is part of our Deep Dish Dialogue series, which is run by both the Errol Food Insti Institute and also the School of Hospitality, Food and Tourism Management. We are really grateful, though, to be able to partner with the Further Education Society of Alberta, which both uh, Ted and Dean are able to, to represent with us today to, to be able to put on this event. And for those who are tuning in online and you may not be aware, today we're doing our event from the Anita Stewart Memorial Food Lab here at the University of Guelph. The University of Guelph resides on the ancestral lands of the Attawandran people and the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We tend to really like think a lot about um, and, and mentioned that, that on our, this land here, we are part of the Dish With One Spoon Covenant. Um, for those that may not know, it's an uh, important pre-colonial agreement, which shares a really important message that we should all be very careful about the resources we need and make sure that we are only taking what we need and making sure we're leaving lots for, for the future generations to come and, and whoever may need the land. Um, and I think that's a really important lesson for us to kind of kick things off today while we're, we're talking a lot about um, Indigenous peoples and culture and, um, and also just, just about food in general and, and where we source our food from. So uh, just to now uh, introduce Ted and Dean properly. So Ted Norris here is uh, the chair of the Pathways National Indigenous Advisory Circle for the Further Education Society of Alberta. Ted Norris is Michif, Cree, French and Scottish heritage, and he's been championing indigenous literacy, education, culture, employment, and social justice issues throughout his professional career. So welcome, Ted, okay. to have, we're grateful to have you here today. And then we have Chef Dean Herkert. So Dean actually flew in late last night from Winnipeg, Manitoba. We're really lucky to have him here, and he's basically been cooking all morning to, to get ready for this. Uh, Dean is the chef and owner of uh, Bistro on Notre Dame in Winnipeg, and Dean is a Red River Métis citizen with over 20 years of experience in the hospitality industry. And... Um, I think maybe we'll we'll take it away from here and we'll get a little bit started. I know that we have a, a packed hour where there's going to be a lot of cooking, but also a lot of discussion. So how about we just start off with you, Dean. Can you tell us what is it that you're cooking today and, and how do we maybe need to, to begin to get started on your dish? <laughs> yeah, uh, what I'm cooking today I call a wildflower risotto. It's hyphenated for sunflower seeds and wild rice. Um, when I was looking at developing my menu, I really wanted to develop some menu items around wild rice. And it took a while for me to, to figure out how I was going to use wild rice as a risotto. I knew I wanted to use it that way. Uh, I just had to kind of compose it. And then, as, additionally as well, I wanted to bring sunflower seeds onto my restaurant menu. Sunflowers, of course, being indigenous to North America. And actually, as it turns out, Manitoba is the number one producer of sunflower seeds in the world. Mm -hmm. So. I thought it was appropriate to try and do it. And it was kind of a bit of a serendipitous <laughs> timing. I was trying to figure out what to do with these ingredients. I was watching a cooking competition show, and it's an American cooking competition show, and it was a, uh, an American Asian. She actually won one of her rounds with a sunflower seed risotto. Mm. And I was looking at <laughs> while she's doing sunflower seed risotto, I can do a sunflower and wild rice risotto and make it my own. So. Uh, that's kind of where the inspiration comes from. Use wild rice, because I don't think it's used enough in North American cuisine. Use sunflowers, because I'm from Manitoba, and we have lots of sunflowers and sunflower seeds. And yes, I really wanted to put my own spin on a risotto. So. <laughs> that's great. And Dean, you, you I don't, are inspired, I think, by a lot of different I don't things that are happening in the culinary world, but also, yes. I guess, international flavors and taking inspiration and yes. trying to put a twist sometimes. Is that true, or yes. am I wrong? <laughs> no, that, that's true. Um, 
we're a multicultural society now. Um, in Winnipeg, we have a lot of Southeast Asians recently that have immigrated, and you look at the history of Winnipeg, there's a lot of different immigration patterns, uh, different uh, um, ethnic groups, societies that have moved into Winnipeg, and as a result, they've influenced it. And I think that's the way North America is going. We used to kind of, used to be that everything was French or Italian, and we never looked past French or Italian, but now, especially with the influx of Southeast Asians, things are changing. Or Japan and Korea, they have their own flavor profiles. And I think they're, they're affecting the culinary scene in North America. I think as we as North Americans try and find our own identity, we're going to be influenced by those that come into the country that are new. So, um, so yes, I'm constantly, like I said, for me, wild rice, it's only natural that I look to Southeast Asia with rice being a primary staple in their diet. There's a lot of inspiration coming from Southeast Asia in terms of how can I change that and make that a North American or a Manitoba version. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. yeah, I guess there's also maybe even a little bit of reflecting back in, in the roots and understanding what food has been growing in the area. Yes, and that's probably... Uh, the restaurant started out, we wanted to source local. It was largely environmental reasons. But the more we look local, the question I had for myself, well, what about indigenous? What was growing here before? Um, you know, when Europeans first arrived, the big thing was is North America was a very fertile continent. It was good for growth. It was a land of plenty. So how did it become a land of plenty? Um, right now, there's a regenerative farming movement. They're kind of revealing mm -hmm. what that's all about. When I went looking for a bison supplier, I really hit on the regenerative farming because their opinion, bison have been here for centuries. They must have been good for the soil, and they were. Um, bison, elk, they were part of the ecosystem. They, in part, contributed to the healthy land that we had or have. So, and it's a return to that kind of ecosystem, uh, bringing back stuff that's indigenous. Um, the environment affects us, genetically modifies us as much as we genetically modify the environment. We respond to the environment. If we're to survive, we have to adjust to the environment. So, and I think that's the culmination when Europeans first came to North America was at least 16,000 years of uh, working with the environment. So. That's a good little background there. And I know we're gonna yeah. dive in and talk about lots of different things, but I know that the time, time is important. So maybe yes. you can begin your, your demo. And then once we've got kind of it going, then we're gonna turn it over to Ted to talk a bit. So with uh, yeah. with the wildflower risotto. Yep. That's it. So with the wildflower risotto, we start with a base of butter, onions, and garlic. Um, and getting used to induction. There we go. <laughs> now, here, I'll move it. Okay. So, and I think this is the basic start for any risotto. And in North American cuisine, we know that onions and garlic grew wild in North America. A fun fact I just learned when I toured, went to Chicago and went on a boat tour, Chicago is actually named because the natives that there were at the time, they called garlic Chicago. And they called that area Chicago because garlic grew wild in that area and it was rampant. So Chicago is actually the native term for garlic. Hmm. So in your pan there right now, so we have butter, onion, butter. garlic. Yes, and some salt and pepper. And we're just going to start um, cooking it, making, getting the butter and garlic translucent. And then we're going to add our wild rice and our sunflower to the pan because we want to brown them a little bit and get the starch developed in them before we deglaze with wine and add our stock. Um, and in this base, there's a few different ways. Today we're going to add mushrooms to the finished product. If you had dehydrated or smoked mushrooms, you could probably put it in earlier in the phase if you wanted the mushrooms integrated into the result. Right now, the way I do it, I, I smoke my mushrooms and then in the restaurant, and then they're added late in the process to the dish. 
And yeah, t- today's a little bit different. We're, yes. We're, we're in Ontario, and also you have to rely on me, me to get all your ingredients. Yes. But um, yeah, it should, I think, be a very delicious meal and um, trying to yeah, give a little bit of nod to what you try to do in your restaurant. Yes. So yeah, so um, basically when it came to risotto, a lot of what I thought about was um, actually where I, where I originally started with this was when I was looking at pesto recipes. Everybody knows the standard pesto recipe, basil, parsley, pine nuts, parmesan cheese. I asked myself, well, can I make a, pe- a pesto with something other than pine nuts? Can I use different herbs and come up with a different pesto? Um, so it kind of evolved from there. And for me, yes, for, um, obviously when I saw the sunflower seeds used in a risotto, I thought, yes, that's a natural. Uh, disappointed I didn't think about it myself, but <laughs> more than happy to copy somebody else in that process. So um, so for me, a lot of my cooking is that. It's uh, take traditional recipes. I have a fesenjun recipe at my restaurant, and fesenjun recipe is a Persian dish. They use um, pomegranate, walnuts, and saffron rice. I'm not going to bring those into the restaurant because, well, sunflower is, some, yeah, sunflower is really expensive. Uh, pomegranate is an imported ingredient. Cranberry belongs to the same family as pomegranate, so I use cranberry instead. Um, and instead of sunflower rice, I use wild rice. Um, so I'm always looking for that substitution. Can you bring an ingredient in here and find an indigenous replacement? So in colloquial terms, rather than transplant stuff in here, Take from it, get inspired from it, and use what's here already to develop your menu. Mm-hmm. So it's smelling really good. It looks like it's yeah. coming along. How do you know when it's ready to go? I guess you look at it's, it right now and you see. You, you look at it in part, and it's aroma. The aroma will the aroma. tell you a lot of what's going on with your dish. Okay, so you have the sunflower seeds and the wild rice in, mm. and now you're mixing it all up. And yeah, I, and I want to keep cooking them until I see that the sunflower seeds are starting to brown. Um, that will give me a little bit of texture on the bottom of the pan, and I'll deglaze with wine at that point in time. Um, Sunflower seeds are very resilient, so in the time it takes to cook the wild rice, the sunflowers are going to hold up and maintain the texture. And the most important part is the sunflower seeds part of the flavor of the rest of the dish. So you don't need a lot of extra spices or seasoning when you're using sunflower seeds. So Ted, as I mentioned, is part of Further Education Society of Alberta. And... um, and I need notes. <laughs> <laughs> so Good we have job. some some slides that are up as well too, so you can get a little bit okay. of a sense of what he's talking about as well. Okay, Tanse. Bonjour. Hello. I'm very pleased to represent FESA, as we're known, for the Education Society of Alberta. Um, I bring greetings from Elaine Cairns and Teal to Tonaway and our small but mighty team at FESA. So this is a quick overview of the pathways uh, to meaningful employment for Indigenous youth in tourism and hospitality. We've gotten um, multi-year funding from the Federal Sectoral Initiatives Program. So this slide, what you're looking at here, is uh, participants and facilitators at the Indigenous Workplace Learning Circles in Stony Nation say around Morley, Alberta, just outside of Calgary, as part of their Skills Link program. They're wearing ribbon skirts that they've made and showing the drums they've finished uh, during the Cultural Week traditional skills component of the program. The uh, Indigenous Workplace Learning Circles, again, this is at the uh, Stony Nation Job Resource Centre, and this was for the first cohort of students in the Cooks with Stones program. Cooks with Stones is a takeoff. Uh, the Blackfoot people uh, would call, and maybe still do, the Stony Nation, the people who cook with stones. So we amended that just a, a tad. 
So the uh, Indigenous Workplace Learning Circles, or IWLC, is a pro program that FASA developed with Indigenous communities. It can be adapted, and in this case we adapted it for the Cooks with Stones and the Stony community. So the IWLC program provides literacy and essential skills development to address community and employment training needs, um, practice and talk through real workplace scenarios, such as mock interviews, right? Um, Stony, some of the Stony youth, they're, um, they're traditionally very quiet, very shy. They like behind the scenes. So they need, they, they need and appreciate uh, the practice for how to do a job interview. Uh, it also facilitates the transfer of traditional skills to job skills needed for culinary and customer service jobs in hospitality and tourism. And there are other uh, skills development such as support for work and food safety ticket completion. Slide three. The, um, so this is all about the Stony Nakoda storytelling uh, program that we do. Culture and literacy exchange workshop uh, for a pursuit tourism company. Uh, the workshop is for, this particular one, was for tour boat guides at Moline Lake, which is right around, um, or close to Jasper, Provinci um, Provinci sorry, Jasper National Park in Alberta. If you've never been, go. Beautiful. <laughs> so the cultural awareness training occurs every year for the Pursuit uh, uh, Company, which is our employer partner, um, and before the Cooks with Stones program begins. It focuses on storytelling, literacy, and the culture, in this case, the culture and traditions of the Stony people, and the relationship of these to the workplace success. One of my favorite people, because of his name, <clears throat> Lionel Crow spreads his wings. I'll say that again, <laughs> because I love it. Lionel Crow <laughs> spreads his wings, is a program manager at the Stony Nation Job Resource Center. He says, when we implement culture into these programs with indigenous workplace learning circles, we help the individual to identify themselves. They already know what some of their skills are but we're just reminding them what they That's nice. Thank you, Lionel. <laughs> so one last slide before we uh, turn back to Dean. So this is um, Chef Scott Iserhoff. <coughs> Excuse me. Traditionally from, uh, traditionally, <laughs> originally, <coughs> from uh, Attawapiska in uh, Northern Ontario. Uh, here he is in summer 2022 teaching the second cohort of students for the Cooks with Stones at the place he selected to cook uh, at the uh, Traditional Knowledge and Skills Camp. I was actually at this camp, this particular camp, and they managed to get it while it wasn't raining. This photo, so that was nice. <laughs> One of the reasons we thought Chef Scott would be a good uh, fit for the program is his commitment to mentorship. He lamented the lack of indigenous chef mentors on his own journey and how he would have benefited from that, especially early on in his career. So the first week of the program, this program starts with a traditional camp in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Elders are key and central always to the program, sharing their learnings about traditional skills that are transferable to the workplace, such as the seven grandfather teachings. There will be a test on this later. Um, those are love, respect, bravery, truth, honesty, humility, and wisdom. All good tenets to live by. Just to uh, round it off here, week one activities for the tradi traditional camp include a daily smudge, traditional land use, land mapping and traditional names of places and hunting grounds, horse riding, hunting and scouting, learning about kinship and traditional roles, storytelling and teachings by elders. The elders like to tease a lot. There'll be a lot of laughter as well. Stony language and literacy, 
cooking with wild meat and ingredients in a fire oven pit, which it is not, <laughs> and TP teachings. Back to you. Okay, that's great. So I have a, a lot of follow-up questions, but I'm wondering okay. though, Dean, do we, yep. do we need to move on to the next step here first? Yeah. So we've browned our rice, so we're just gonna deglaze the pan, and bring the flavors together with a little bit of white wine. Mm. So and then while we're waiting for that, we'll put out some duck breast, and we'll slowly start cooking our duck breast in our pans mm. in a minute. Uh, smoked duck breast. This is actually King Cole Ducks. They're here in Ontario. Um, I just really love a smoked duck product. Um, <laughs> in my restaurant, actually, I do it myself, and I actually will do Montreal smoked duck breast. So much mm -hmm. the same way you get Montreal smoked brisket, in my restaurant you would get Montreal smoked duck breast. Very similar. Um, King Cole, very good quality, high quality product here in the province. Um, I come to Ontario or Quebec to get ducks because there are no ducks <laughs> wanderers in Manitoba. It still is a relatively... Um, well, it's an exotic ingredient, ingredient for lack of a better word. Um, you know, um, I was telling Rebecca about it. Before the Spanish arrived in North America and Mexico, duck and turkey were the primary uh, proteins there. They had actually, the Aztecs in Mexico had actually domesticated ducks and turkeys and were raising them in farm-like settings. Um, and then obviously, turkey and duck throughout North America, we know there's a duck hunting season. In Manitoba, we have a very healthy wild turkey population again. Um, so as much as possible, yes, I like to go back to those. Um, instead of chicken, this is where I better. For me too, once I started tasting duck, duck fat, it was <laughs> so, and do we have a knife for you? Yeah. So I'm not sure, in on Ontario, in restaurants we can't serve um, any meat that's been caught wild. Um, d is it different in No, it's Manitoba? no different in Manitoba. Um, I'm not sure if it's... Uh, basically any meat that goes into a food establishment has to be processed in a federally or a provincially inspected facility. Um, so yes, that does kind of limit it because you have to find a butcher or whatever that would know how to do it. Uh, I use my bison and elk from farmers, both in the province of Manitoba, and like I said, our duck and uh, turkey, duck from Eastern Canada, turkey from Manitoba itself too. Um, so I'm not sure if it's just that wild caught game can't be done or if it has to pass through an inspected facility before it gets to the restaurant. So, so we've, the alcohol's gone in the risotto. So now we're just gonna pour in. So sometimes when I, I think I, watch people make risotto like I guess maybe more the Italian way they're yep. doing little little yeah. amounts at a time does the, it make it obviously you're using wild rice it's totally kind of different you're adding all the liquid in at the same time does it change the well, texture that, or that was probably the best thing when I saw the sunflower seed risotto because I know wild rice is much hardier much firmer than a traditional white rice so now when I put this in I can bring it to a boil and just leave it I don't have to stir it if I don't want to. I'll check because I want to make, I want to cook it until the rice is done and, and then finish the preparation. But right now, this is good. I don't have to tend to it like a traditional risotto. It's going to hold up under that. Um, and actually with the competition I saw, she, she used a pressure cooker. So uh, it's a much hardier ingredient. So now we can just leave that and we can work on just getting our duck breast going. Uh, let's see. I actually don't need a lot of butter for this because we put the duck breast in fat side down and it's going to do a lot of what the butter would do anyways. And let's see, let's get this guy going. There we go. So what kind of heat do you do you have your pan on then? Um, 
right now in here, I'll, <laughs> I'll put it on a medium low because this has been smoked. It's already been cooked. Uh, so basically, all we have to do is re-therm it. Uh, you can, with smoked duck, like in my restaurant, I'll hold this at a medium rare temperature and then I'll flash sear it to order there. Um, so it's been, and when I hold it at temperature, I'm holding it in either butter or duck, duck fat. And it goes on to a high temperature fan and it's the big showy, hits the pan, big flames come out. Mm -hmm. And you get that real uh, char flavor on the duck breast itself. So, but here, yes, because it is already smoked, I just have to make sure we get back up to temperature. We render the fat a little bit. And uh, yeah, it'll be ready at that point. Maybe while you're finishing prepping those ones, I just have a follow-up question for sure. you, Ted. So when you're talking about um, the program and cooks with stones and pathways, what what is there a reason why the hospitality and tourism industry was selected as a potential industry to do skills training for? Uh, yeah, one reason is the um, the need for more workers. We found that out, and I'm looking out in the audience and seeing Stasha Elliott here. Um, <laughs> Uh, need for more workers in the industry, mm -hmm. for sure. This particular program appeals to the uh, indigenous youth that they know they can sometimes work within their own territory, which is really important, right? In or near their territory, yeah. And then the other one, and you'll see that coming up soon, is uh, the opportunity to work worldwide. Mm -hmm. You know, across Canada, the world is their oyster. I mean, it's really something mm -hmm. else, yeah. That's great. I think there's also just so much probably knowledge you could learn through food and, and learning about culture as well, too, maybe. Oh, yeah, and then probably, you know, Dean can speak maybe more, um, more to this, uh, uh, you know, uh, from his experience. But we, we know that the... the I don't know if we would call it a resurgence of indigenous cuisine, but the interest in the indigenous cuisine, the, uh, the opportunity for chefs and others to um, renew and create new um, ingredients and dishes and all that. Again, it's limitless right now. The interest is huge. Yeah. Um, um, for me, what got me interested in Cooks with Stones was the whole concept of Cooks with Stones. Dig a pit, cook your meat. Um, in Texas, they call it pit barbecue. Mm -hmm. I wonder where they got that idea from. Because mm -hmm. the original pit barbecue was pit. Yes, now they've taken big drums and taken it above ground, but it's still called pit barbecue. So where mm -hmm. did that come from? We know in Europe, smoking and barbecue was not a big thing, especially pit cooking. Um, and we also know... So we now know that Stony Nakoda, people that cook with stones. Uh, when I went to New Zealand, the Maori people were big on the same traditions. Bury their food in the ground, superheat stones, bury the food in the ground, let it cook, come back, dig it up, and it's all ready to go. Um, so for me, yeah, in cuisine, um, now that it's, it's a lot safer for elders to share their knowledge, we can now go to the elders and find out the <coughs> traditional things they did the knowledge they've kept that they weren't really allowed to share or were discouraged from sharing. So now they can share that information with us. And for Indigenous chefs across the country, they can now have um, a pass to look to. Um, mm. There's a little bit of a pause in there, so we kind of have to find our way back to what would have happened if we were allowed to evolve and cook the whole time. You know, there was basically at least a 150-year pause on... Cult I call it cultural development because food is part of culture. Mm -hmm. You know, it's song, it's dance, it's music, it's comedy, it's spoken word, um, and it's food. It's how you prepare your food, how you share your food, what food you're using. So, um, so yes, in recent history now, there seems to be a lot more availability of that information. Uh, like I said, some of it's hidden because they'll call it, um, right, one of the examples I use is the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. A regenerative farming calls it intercropping, mm -hmm. right? So 
um, same idea. Um, like I said, when I talk to the bison farmers, those bison farmers tell me that their soil, their environment is just a lot healthier. The bison farmer I use have said they've seen a lot more birds on the pond in their property and a lot more variety of birds since they introduced the bison herd back to that property. So, yes, yeah, so now from, it's kind of like a rabbit hole. If you start looking local indigenous, it can be a deep mm -hmm. hole as to how far down you can go as to find out what's going on. Um, so, yes, in the indigenous cuisine, it is starting to emerge now. Um, like I said, elders can now speak about it. And you have some ambitious chefs. And to speak to Ted's work, if you're in the hospitality industry, you know about the whole resort industry. Um, in Manitoba, we have Elkhorn Resort and Hecla Resort. And there are a lot of foreign people, um, travelers from Australia, England, that work the resort circuit. So they go to Jasper, they go to Elkhorn Resort or whatever. And then there's a lot of Canadian workers that will go out and work other resorts. So yes, it is an opportunity, hopefully, Indigenous mm -hmm. students, if that's one of the things they want to do, and that's their way to experience the world, is work and travel, then yes, hopefully hopefully that develops. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, the, the skills yeah, to, to be able to work anywhere at all, and, yes. and even even here in, in our own country. So here's a question. Has AI developed smell of vision yet? This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it get, does smell get really good, that. I know. For, yeah. for an online, I'm, I'm sorry, you can't, you can't smell the delicious smells. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, um, how are you doing there, Dean, with, with the dish? It's like you're checking good. in, and... Yeah. So, It'll be about another 20 minutes for the rice. We just have to bring our duck breast up to temperature. We'll hold it in the oven and we'll put the plate together on final presentation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Perfect. Okay, so I think then this is maybe a good time then for uh, Ted. If we talk a little bit more, we've got a few more slides sure. and talk about <laughs> the big exciting event that Cuts with Stones was a part of. There we are uh, on the rooftop of Canada House in London, England. Wow. So there's a number of us there. Um, seven uh, Indigenous youth um, were, we, we took along to London. Uh, there's a couple of, of our facilitators there as well. Right in the middle in the blue shirt is the Honorable Ralph Goodale, who is the High Commissioner for Canada uh, in the United Kingdom. And he was the one who invited us to come along to come along, to come to England uh, and help celebrate Canada Day in mm -hmm. England. And of course, you see the chef here, right on the right, next to his lovely partner, Celeste. Uh, it was an incredible experience. This, is, uh, this actually was taken just after we had a smudge ceremony uh, by uh, Elder Barry uh, Wesley, who's standing right next to Ralph. And it was the first time we had been we were told that they had had a smudge ceremony at Canada House in, in London. So wow. kudos to them, and we left them in a good way because of that, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, so the learners, or the students, participated in catering the VIP reception at Canada House. We had a private meeting with the High Commissioner and his Deputy High Commissioner, Robert Fry. And we were part of Canada Day celebrations on Trafalgar Square. They weren't on July 1st. Uh, it was June 29th. The square had already been booked. It's a long story. I won't go into it. But uh, anyway, it was still very, very interesting. In the lead up to that, um, the students curated menus. They were provided support to complete um, their food safety tickets. They had communications training, and most, pretty important as well, they had support to get passports. So, oh, getting a passport for many of them is their first time Absolutely. traveling. Absolutely. If you can go to the next slide, yeah. please. So here's the man of the hour in the Canada House kitchen. <laughs> Just over his shoulders, the white-haired lad there, is um, the Canada House chef. Uh, Gavin Sayer. <laughs> kind of funny, it's very neat. We were told in advance that, well, okay, you can bring your students over. Chef Sayer is a little bit of a crusty New Zealander. I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Well, 
he might have been crusty somewhere. It was not he was amazing. Right? Uh, Dean and he hit it off. We're going to try and get him, get him to Canada, actually, to Winnipeg and, and other places. I was hoping he'd get to Winnipeg in the mid, middle of February, but it looks like it's going to be later. <laughs> oh, well. Um, let's go to the next one. And so this is the, the students in T-shirts, obviously, at, uh, at Trafalgar Square, just before uh, the festivities um, started. So William, who's, uh, who's quoted here, he's standing directly under the, under the, uh, the quote. And as you say, a first-time experience. This was her, his first time uh, on a plane, his first time out of Alberta. He'd probably been to Calgary before. And he, I mean, you gotta have favorites, right? He was amazing. Just, just. You just aired that, and now all everyone's gonna see. <laughs> They're all great. I hope he's watching. <laughs> no, really. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Let's okay. Turn it over to you. So, what, what is it that you cooked when you were there? Uh, we did, um, originally the students wanted to do a poutine, but we couldn't do it because just with the way this scheduling worked out. So we ended up doing um, a venison and wild rice dish with chaga gravy. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if you know what chaga is, but chaga is actually a mushroom that grows on birch trees. So when the birch tree is damaged, it, this mushroom grows to help heal the birch tree. So the First Nations people would remove the chaga, grind it down and drink it as a tea. Um, nowadays it's called a superfood for its anti-inflammatory products, uh, properties and it's just considered a really healthy food. And actually, it does make a really good gravy, too. Mm -hmm. So we did a slow-roasted venison with, with venison drippings and chaga gravy with wild rice, corn, and yeah, and that was the major. So we tried to keep it indigenous mm -hmm. ingredients to North America. We couldn't do bison. We wanted to do bison, but um, there's not much bison in England. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> The only bison rancher in England is actually more of a family farm. And the way he explained to Gavin is, yeah, I can provide you with the bison, but we're going to have to take one of our petting bisons. In no. <laughs> and so it was like, okay, we'll, we'll do venison. Yeah. Venison seems to be a worldwide uh, uh, protein. You know, deer is pretty well throughout the world now. Mm. Um, so it was a venison and chaga, wild rice. And then we also did a wild rice pudding with blueberries and anise and a raspberry whipped cream. So, uh, yes, wild rice is that versatile. It makes some really great desserts, or you can go savory, um, like we're doing here today. Can I just add something here? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, uh, maybe you're gonna ask this anyway, but uh, during the VIP reception, um, the food that uh, Chef Dean just talked about, uh, it's too bad I didn't think to show you a slide of one of the notable people digging in right to the bottom. Um, the Right Honorable Joe Clark showed up for the reception and he was digging it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He, he was loving it. Yeah. Well, as a chef, one of the things you like to look for or listen to is when they're just Getting every last bit, out of the, you know, and he, he was—he was being talked at. He's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Always a good sign. So, over overall, what was the reception like? Like, how did how did people were people interested and wanted to learn more? What was it like being in an international country and talking about your program? Yeah, they yeah. seemed genuinely interested. I think we were part of it was also Canada trying to attract Great Britain business to Canada okay. business people. So we saw quite a few business people from uh, England and then yes, quite a few dignitaries related to Canada. Our foreign affairs minister was there at the time and, and I think there was one other cabinet minister I'm not sure, but um, Minister of Defense so, Oh yes. Anita and Anne. Yes. Okay. Minister of Defense, yes. <clears throat> and um, yeah, probably um, Dana, who in the picture here is sitting down in front, he's had some work experience with Parks Canada. Uh, he's been a tour guide out at Banff. Um, and halfway through this, him and I are serving down at the VIP reception, and halfway through the event, he kind of said to me, it's like, wow, this is different. And you could see him come out of his shell. It was like mm -hmm. talking to these people was just a different experience. Um, just a level of curiosity and information 
how informed they were to begin with and the curiosity and the way they expressed it. Um, he was really impressed with the experience at that point in time. So one of our other favorites, in case you're watching, Dana. <laughs> no, really great guy. Oh, that's yeah. great. The reception uh, was really cool. It was just so neat to be there. And again, I looked to William, and it opened up his world. What will, what will that mean in the coming months and years? We'll see. You know, but it was, it was pretty special. Yeah. Thank you. So with your, your program, as you mentioned before, there's a lot of training and, and I guess mentorship and coaching. What do you think, if other people are trying to learn from your experience, what is, what is the important thing to be able to provide these youth with um, a good experience? And sure, sure. The basics, um, using the, uh, in our case, the Indigenous Workplace Learning mm -hmm. Circles and that training, uh, we have amazing facilitators. And we will go out and use facilitators in the local community as well. Mm -hmm. So there's that comfort between whomever is taking the, uh, the course, the training, and um, who's giving it, you know, the facilitators. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of that uh, background training. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of the preparation. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of the mentorship, like having someone like Chef Dean, oh, um, yeah. someone to look up to, must provide a lot of confidence as well too, and being able mm -hmm. to see maybe themselves in in a yeah, cooking go, world. Yeah, we go back to Chef Eiserhoff and what he would have liked to have seen. He would have liked, loved to have seen Dean, you know, being a mentor and a guide, mm -hmm. you know, through his journey, right? Mm -hmm. For sure. Great. So, Dean, where where are we at right now? Do you think? I'm just gonna grate some cheese now. Okay. Um, so, what kind what kind of cheese is it that you would like to, to, um, to use? <laughs> so, we actually have a local cheese maker in Manitoba called Bothwell Cheese. Um, they are they are a notable cheese maker. I know they've won some cheese competitions. Um, when I try their cheese products, they have a great lineup of cheeses. Still no more time. Mm -hmm. um, the mush the, the cheese we're using today is the mushroom truffle jack cheese. Um, like I said, they have about eight to a dozen different types of cheese. And they do some of the traditional stuff. My favorite cheeses from them is smoked gouda and the mushroom truffle jack. But I will use, they have a marble, they have a red wine, extra old cheese. Um, those are the four I use in my restaurant on a regular basis. So, um, so yes, I really like the local cheese. Um, yeah, so um, keeping it local as much as possible. Um, we actually make our own ricotta cheese in house from scratch. So uh, other than that, yes, it's Bothwell or it's what I make <laughs> in the restaurant. That's so, pretty great. Yeah, it's impressive. So you, so we have to grate the cheese then, and yeah, we'll get it ready. As soon as the rice is cooked, we can turn up the heat and start reducing the liquid. We'll add cheese and cream to it and bring it all together. And when, when you add the cream, what is the purpose of that? Just, Just to add that savoriness that, mm. you know. Um, unfortunately for us as humans, we're hardwired to really enjoy saturated fats and sugars. <laughs> Um, that's why dessert is always the best desserts are heavy in saturated fats and some sort of sweetener. Um, so yes, so the cheese and the cream take care of that. <laughs> so. so maybe while you're waiting for the, the rice to still cook a little bit more, maybe we can talk a little bit more with you, Ted, and um, sure. to your final section of slides. Yeah. Mm. We have to have numbers. <laughs> so here's a few. Um, so, so far in the program, uh, we've got 14 participating employers. We've got 12 community organizations and bridging organizations. And 10 specific tools developed for participants, community, and employers. So the tools, Focus on confidence, skill building, recruitment, onboarding and training, retention, and mentorship. Oh. So here's something, still, it's a work in progress. Uh, this is um, what we're calling Miyasin, 
Michuan. It's cream and chip, and it means good food. Coincidence, eh? No. <laughs> um, so we're planning this right now. Um, we're um, working with uh, Chef Dean, obviously, and, and the bistro. Uh, and he'll play a pivotal role. The focus is going to be on Métis youth in and around the Winnipeg area. And we're just now starting to develop partnership agreements with key learning and community-based organizations in the area. I would like to name them, but I don't want to overstep at this point. Do you want to say anything about your involvement? Um. No, I'm just really excited being being a Red River mate to you and all. I really would like to hear from our elders and from our community those those secrets that they've kept, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, there is a large Métis population in Manitoba. It's growing every day as more people realize and do their heritage to find out whether or not they're Métis. And so for me in, in this, it's like I said, food is culture. This is part of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can talk about tourism as a business. I think one of the trends in tourism is towards what was indigenous in the area. Myself, I'm not a personal fan of going on vacation and doing the all-inclusive. You know, so you know, we went to Cuba one year. You do the all-inclusive. You know, sit by the pool or the beach and you do nothing for seven days and enjoy the weather. Um, one of the best experiences I had was when we left the resort, we went into Old Havana and we experienced Cuba for what it was. Um, learned a lot about food, Cuban food, and a lot about the society at that point in time. And I think tourism is headed that way, trade is headed that way. Um, people want and all to more and more people to the destination are going that there is a history, there is a story to be told. You know, good mm -hmm. or bad, this is the story. Um, my mother-in-law actually went down to South Carolina and she said, yes, in South Carolina they are now acknowledging the history they have pertaining to slavery and whatnot. And it's made the experience richer as far as I'm concerned. She was impressed by it. It's, you know, it's not this was, you know, this is what happened. This is in the past where moving on, correcting the situation. And I think for Manitoba, this is a step in that direction too, to recognizing the Métis population that was here and how they contributed to the development of the province and this country in the time that uh, they arrived or came into being. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And we were talking this morning uh, over coffee about, uh, uh, you know, the, the terms that are being used. I don't know, Chef Dean, it was talking about boule, right? So, um, yeah. Did we say that again? So, boule? Actually, it's boulette. Boulette? Boulette, so yes, okay. boulette. <laughs> no, excuse me, moi. Um, <laughs> boulette. And so, when we're, um, if you ever get a chance to, uh, here's another thing on your travel agenda, go to uh, Batoche, Saskatchewan, uh, the site of the back to Batoche um, war, of rebellion, rather. Um, the elders there that the uh, at the celebration, we'll serve something called bullets and, and bangs. Boule et bien. Right? So basically, the meatballs and the banner. It's very really cute. Very cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, bullets and bangs, love them. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's great. And yeah, we were talking earlier about a lot about, um, I guess, tourism and indigenous businesses. I think that there's been a huge investment as well in the last few years with developing indigenous tourism here. Um, oh, yeah. I think that's kind of really helped maybe some people learn a bit about mm -hmm. history and culture. Sure, and we've got two national, important national organizations. One is ITAC, the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada, and the other is ICANN, Indigenous mm -hmm. Culinary Associated. Association, Associated, Associated Nations. Nations. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> apologies to uh, Jenny Lassar, who's the executive director, for, for mangling that. But yeah, those those organizations are also key um, to um, uh, making sure that uh, Canadians in general and around the world understand what we're trying to do mm -hmm. in this area. Yeah, for sure. That's great. Mm -hmm. So I know that we have about, I think, 10 minutes left. I'm 
I know that it's tough for waiting for the rice and yeah. how how you feel things are going right now, Dean. In about two minutes, I can yeah. add the cheese and the cream. Perfect. So, um, so I think the one thing with the, with the wild rice is that it is a lot hardier and it does take a lot longer than the yeah, normal rice. Yeah, it does take a little while. And it depends on the breed of the rice, too. From what I understand, there's um, it's either seven or nine different types of wild rice in Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, the wild rice I typically use comes from northern Manitoba, like we're talking 500 miles north of Winnipeg. So certified organic because literally other than the community that's there, there's nobody else in the area. So it's, um, and that type of, that wild rice is definitely a different strain than this one. But yes, so there is a little bit, if you want to cook with wild rice, you do have to trial your wild rice because depending on the strain, the characteristics are a little bit different. And wild rice and a, and a shout out to, in case some of you didn't see this earlier, a shout out to our mutual friend Sharon Redsky for making this beautiful apron. Um, she's a, she's a, uh, from originally from Shoal Lake, and that's her reserve. And um, they have quite a, a thriving, I think you could say, uh, wild rice uh, company as well. Right, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Shout out to them. That's great. Mm -hmm. okay, so that's some of the liquid yeah. there. But this <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not small at all. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, one more thing just to, to ask you about, Dean. Um, I do, I've heard that you are part of a Nation to Nation trading program. Yes. Um, the Manitoba Métis Federation is trying to set up Nation to Nation trading programs. So right now, um, some of our coffee and the sugar we use in the restaurant comes from Colombia. There's an indigenous tribe in Colombia that grows their own coffee and cane sugar. So they ship it directly to the Manitoba Métis Federation and we are using it in the restaurant uh, to help foster that relationship. And that's something the Manitoba Métis Federation is looking to do, looking for other indigenous nations throughout the world to set up direct trade agreements with. Um, part of the ethos of the if, my bistro is, is if we can find out as much as possible about where our stuff is coming from, the better. Um, like I said, the original was source local. If you can't source locally, source responsibly and ethically. So take a look at where, what you're buying and where you're getting it from. And the Manitoba Métis Federation is pursuing that. They really want to establish those relationships that benefit other indigenous populations directly. Uh, and there's that accountability. There is no shipping chain or supply chain mm -hmm. that has to follow. It's from this tribe in Colombia up to the Manitoba Métis Federation. So for me, that traceability uh, speaks a lot to what I'm trying to do in, in my bistro. It's no different than the farmers I look for in the area that I want to buy my produce from when I can. You know, six months out of the year, we're limited to what we can buy locally, but when it is there, I like to know as much as I can about the people and the products I'm getting. That's great. Give you one last time. Yeah. Another shout out to uh, uh, Further Education Society. So, um, for more information, obviously you can contact either Elaine or myself. Uh, you can also go to their website, furthered.ca, furthered.ca, and we've got a wonderful um, blog area mm -hmm. uh, which shows a lot more information and pictures and all of that about the Cooks with Stones program when we were in England. It's like, you know, Abbey Road and, you know, all that kind of thing. Crossing the... Uh, <laughs> everybody got to do that, right? Um, anyways, there's some really good resources there. Um, the, um, yeah. And uh, again, I'm, I'm big on shout outs. So we've got Craig and Narada and Shauna and Judy. Uh, they just do a wonderful job in terms of uh, providing us with the information to share. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to, uh, to do that in, in this venue. So well, that's shout out funny. to them. Yeah. And so, so, yeah, of course, it's, I think over the last year that mm -hmm. I've been working with you and in, yeah. in discussions, it's been interesting to see how the program has been evolving yeah, constantly true. and it seems like true. you have so many different projects on the go and, and things to do. I think that's very, very exciting yeah. for the future. Well, for sure. 
I know that uh, Dean wants us to, uh, uh, Shauna and I, Shauna Linklater, who's originally from northern Manitoba, and I were out in uh, the Yukon uh, in, in December, of course, which was fantastic, and we want to go back there. Right? We've got other places as well mm -hmm. uh, that we're looking to, to expand the program. Uh, Mias and Michigan is certainly a good one, mm -hmm. and we'll have some more learning um, to do from that, especially at the, at the, with, the with the good uh, graces of uh, Chef Dean here. So. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So it looks like, Dean, you're cutting up the duck now. Yes. Which is great. So put that back in for now. Mm -hmm. mm. I can hear people in the audience. Yeah. Like, oh, it smells yeah. good. <laughs> can you hear my? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> our stomachs are going. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Dean, just while we're kind of in the the process of almost sort of wrapping up, yeah. Um, where can people learn more about your your restaurant, or if they want to follow along and see what you're doing? Uh, yep. Yeah. So we have a website, bistronotredame.com. Um, as well, we're present on Facebook and Instagram. I think both of them are Bistro on Notre Dame. It might be Bond784 on Instagram, I'm not sure, but Bistro on Notre Dame dot com, our website, and our Facebook page, Bistro on Notre Dame. Just looking at the, <coughs> sorry, the duck being cut up here, uh, I was in conversation with another in, indigenous chef, actually Shane Chartrand, and um, I was reflecting on, because uh, you know, what What my youth, my childhood used to be, I was raised by my grandma and grandfather, and uh, we were, my grandma especially, was the hub, right? We all, we all know that we all have that person in our lives. And we had lots of duck, because my uncles would go hunting. We had moose, we had venison, we had fish, smoked fish, and, and et cetera, just, and it was, you know, it wasn't indigenous food. This was our lunch. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it was so cool to now reflect on how lucky were we, mm -hmm. right? To have yeah. that experience. Yeah, think back. Yeah, because everybody would come to our place with stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think thing. there's something so valuable about mm -hmm. being able to share something with people too and the yeah. connections you're able to make and you, you learn so much about mm -hmm. other people and cultures. Mm -hmm. One of the things my grandma would make every Christmas was um, la pachin, it was called, a pudding with suet and spices. Okay. And last February, why is it always February in, in Winnipeg, uh, the, <laughs> the uh, International Indigenous Tourism Conference was on, and Jenny okay. Lassard, mm -hmm who is a uh, Saskatchewan-based chef and, as I mentioned, uh, currently executive director of the uh, ICANN group. She was one of the featured chefs with uh, A Taste of Turtle Island, which was, um, I think, nine or ten chefs all together, mm -hmm. you know, all doing their own thing. And Jenny made La Pouchine, and oh my God, I had the second last one. I could have eaten 30 of them. <laughs> it was incredible. What a, what a great memory to have. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So Dean is just kind of plating things up right now. Mm. So you got the, the rice and, or the risotto, I should call yes. it, because it's a <laughs> fully finished dish. You just added some mushrooms. Mm. And then you've got the avocado here. And so. Why? Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering, yeah, you're going to add the, the duck yeah, next? Yes. yes. So there's a few options. Um, one of the things I'm moving towards is, um, like I said, I flash through my ducks, so you get some really nice grill marks and seeds. <laughs> so. so those are sunflower shoots. Yep, some sunflower shoots. Um, hemp heart. It's grown in Manitoba. There is... Um, pretty good. Oh. There we go. <laughs> so, and then some wildflowers, edible flowers. Go on top. So 
that is the wildflower resort. Well done. So it looks like a gorgeous dish, and I think it probably tastes even better. Uh, for those who are in person, you'll likely be able to taste a little bit yeah, just after we wrap up. I, um, Ted and Dean, do you have any kind of final, final notes you wanted to say about your involvement with Cooks with Stones? or? I want to I wanna give kudos to the Deep Dish Dialogue. Um, you've done a wonderful job, personally. Uh, you've kept us going, you've kept us on time. Good for you, that's really important. It's been wonderful to work with you. And again, Stasha, thank you for initiating all of this just over a year ago, about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you very much. Maybe we'll be back. Oh man, we'd love to have you back. <laughs> well, thank you for being a part of it. And and Dean, anything? Yep. No, I've, Final I've, bits of wisdom. <laughs> no, I would kind of echo what Ted said. I mean, uh, Guelph. I in our discussions, yeah, it's like I said, food. You run a restaurant. You can you can just go for bottom line. You can find the best deals, uh, figure out your marketing. What's the most popular food item? Or you can look into it, and you can look into institutions that are looking at food and going, it's not just about like hospitality management. It's what's behind the story, how is it related to farming, how is it related to our environment. Um, so it's always, it's, it's very positive knowing that we're heading in that direction in some ways. So, yeah. No. Well, thank you. I'm uh, so grateful to have been able to, to work with Chef Dean and Ted um, and the entire, I think, Further Education Society of Alberta yeah. to be able to put on this event. Um, it has been wonderful to watch it kind of grow and, and see what it becomes. And I think it's really been a, a celebration today mm -hmm. of your program and of Indigenous cuisine. And I think we need to constantly be having a lot more conversations about that. And that's one of our, uh, our important values with Deep Dish Dialogues is making sure we're including Indigenous voices and stories. So, so thank you for being a part of that today and looking forward to kind of continuing that. And um, thank you as well to everyone who's, who's in the audience today for coming, being a part of it. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event uh, in November. So thank you and have a great afternoon for those who are online. All right, thank you.